Hey guys, welcome to the first official episode of History in the Dark. Yeah, that's the title I'm going with. Okay, just just roll with it. You don't have to question it, alright? It's a thing we're doing now. It's a thing I'm doing now. And really, I don't know what you expected out of me, okay? I've been calling myself Darkness the Curse for years. I, I feel like it should have been... It, listen, let's just get back on topic. I have had a request for a topic of coverage uh, after my first few, I guess you can call them pilot episodes, although they wouldn't be done called that because usually there's only one of those, sometimes two, in the case of Star Trek. Anyway, I have a request for a topic for me to cover. And, you know, at, at first I didn't really want to do it because, okay, I understand why people are interested in this topic because they were the largest battleships ever made. And that makes them a lot more interesting in theory. But, all right. Today we're going to cover the Yamato-class battleships made by the Imperial Navy of Japan back in World War II. Let's shed some light on this topic, shall we? the Yamato class battleships you think would be really interesting to talk about because yes they were the largest battleships ever created. The first ship in the class named Yamato was laid down in 1937 and was formally commissioned in 1941 right after the attack on Pearl Harbor. She'd served as the flagship of the combined Japanese fleet right up until 1943 when her sister ship the Musashi replaced her. Both these ships were designed to secure naval dominance in the Pacific for the Japanese fleet. We're talking about ships that when fully loaded displaced almost 72 thousand tons, otherwise known as completely unreasonable. There was no need for anything to ever be that big. For contact into the tremendous size of these things, the largest thing the United States Navy was rolling with at the time was the Iowa-class battleship. Their displacement was only a little less than 58,000 tons. And it wasn't just size that gave Yamato a huge edge here. The ship was equipped with nine 18-inch cannons, otherwise known as the largest guns ever mounted on a battleship. This thing was designed to destroy anything it pointed its guns at. It was heavily armored, massive, it was the Death Star of the Pacific Ocean. And it also did absolutely nothing to help the Japanese win the war whatsoever. It is such a waste to see what the Yamato and the Musashi actually accomplished during their relatively short careers during the Pacific Theater, because it amounts to a big load of nothing. Part of the reason why Germany gets talked about more in terms of their naval conflict is they had the Bismarck, which, while not as big as the Yamato, it's true, was a close second, and it managed to actually shoot something, resulting in an epic hunt for the Bismarck that culminated in that ship being sunk years before the Yamato would be. Yes, the Yamato lasted longer than the Bismarck. That's not really relevant, when all the Yamato did for most of its career was kind of just swim around and shoot at planes occasionally. She fired her main cannons in combat one time. I repeat, she fired her guns, those massive guns, 18 inches across, that were designed to shred anything they could possibly hit exactly once during the entire war. You know, there's no point in attaching giant cannons to this giant floating mass of armor if you're never going to use them, and this was kind of the issue the Japanese ran into during the war. And it's not entirely their fault. See, every navy back then had a ton of battleships, but at the time, battleships were kind of getting phased out in terms of viability. They had more use in the Atlantic Theater because there weren't nearly enough aircraft carriers to go around, at least not until America got involved. Up until then, the only real aircraft force was with the UK, and even they only had a handful. The Germany didn't have any. Over in the Pacific, however, not only did you have the US with quite a few aircraft carriers, but you had Japan, which had an entire fleet of them. And the thing about aircraft carriers you have to consider is this. Let's compare them to battleships for a second. Yes. Battleships are heavily armored monstrosities. Their cannons are massive, they do a ton of damage if they hit, they are designed to seek and destroy. However, battleships have to see what they're actually aiming for. But aircraft carriers don't have this problem. Radar would come into play, and effectively you could do the same amount of damage from 100 miles off your target, as opposed to battleships which always had to get up close. And the problem the Yamato and the Musashi kept running into was that the Pacific Theater became an air war. 
not so much a sea war. Yes, it was on the sea, but ultimately, most of the fighting was going on in the sky and being dropped in their heads. And battleships didn't really have that much in the way of anti-aircraft. In fact, the vast majority of the refits that both the Yamato classes got were to fit more anti-aircraft guns on them. They knew this was a problem. This was before surface-to-air missiles, so all they really had were flak cannons, and that was it. So you have to hope your gunners are good enough to lead their shots and actually shoot down the bombers before they drop a 500-pound bomb straight down your exhaust port. It didn't help that the other main source of damage on the Pacific Theater was submarines, which battleships were not really designed to deal with. Oh, they could absorb torpedo damage, but in terms of actually destroying a submarine, that was a job mostly for destroyers. That's what they were for! And yes, the ships were always flanked by a flotilla of destroyers to protect them from submarine attacks, but my point is that the Yamato and the Musashi wound up with very little to do. In terms of battleship versus battleship engagements, it basically never happened during the Pacific War, at least not where these two ships were involved. It didn't help that both sides were really, really against actually deploying their battleships to fight one another. Neither the US nor Japan thought it was a good idea to throw their main battleships, their main fleet force, straight down each other's throats. So they never did it. They always diverted their fleets around. Any fighting was done from a distance via planes or secretly via submarines. It was never done toe-to-toe -to -toe when it came to their main battleship fleet because it was much safer to destroy those kind of ships from the air or from submarines. The only time that really happened was when they were fighting over territory and both fleets had to show up at a specific island, which also happens to be when the Yamato did fire her cannons, but even then, that was mostly to protect the island from the marines, that was also the same battle where they got deluded into thinking they were about to engage the main US fleet when they weren't, and turned around when they had the advantage. So that was good. This was also the same battle where the Musashi was finally sunk, after being hit by an estimated 19 torpedoes and 17 bombs, otherwise known as all the explosions. Just all of them. At once. The Yamato would survive that battle, but she would go on continually to be mainly a troop transport, which is what the battleships were basically doing mostly up until that point, and never ever firing her main guns ever again. She wound up being assigned to Operation Tengo. See, at this point, Japan was a little on the ropes when it came to the Pacific Theater. The war was not going well for them. They were being pushed back at every turn, and America's next step was to take over Okinawa. Japan did not want the Americans to take over yet another island in the middle of the Pacific, because it would just let them have one more staging point towards the Japanese mainland. So the Yamato's part of this plan was actually very strange. Her job was to beach herself on the island, and that would result in her being a nigh-impregnable, unstoppable fortress that would fight until the bitter end. There's so many ways that doesn't make sense to me. Like, I get they were desperate, and I suppose it's better than the kamikaze operations that were going on at this point when it came to the Japanese forces. But at the same time, you have to consider a few things. It's true the Yamato was being shipped there with a full load of, you know, armaments, but you have to be able to resupply not just the armaments on board, but the sailors on board, like with food and water and everything. And, you know, a battleship is hard to destroy, it's true, but at that point, I feel like it would be easier to sail around the thing, because suddenly its maneuverability was irrelevant, because it couldn't go anywhere. It didn't matter anyway, because it never got to the point where it was able to beach itself. She was attacked and sunk on her way there, capsizing and resulting in one of the most massive explosions ever detected from a warship. The fires that were raging on board must have triggered one of her magazines, because she went up with a mushroom cloud. No, it wasn't actually a nuclear explosion, but it looked like one. In fact, some sources say that the explosion was so large that some of the American aircraft flying over her were actually destroyed from the shockwave. The vast majority of her crew would not survive. But that's at the end of the story. See, many people assume the Yamato-class battleships only consisted of two. And that's technically correct, but not exactly so. See, there was a third sister to this little trio of massive warships. It's just the third never got turned into a battleship. Her name was the Shinano, and while her hull was laid down with the intent to create yet another Yamato-class battleship, Japan decided about this point in the war they needed more carriers. They lost four of them at Midway, so they kind of needed to replace some of those. So, since they had this extra hull, they figured, well, why not build just a giant carrier? And that wasn't the worst thought, 
it wouldn't be the first time a hull that was intended for a different kind of ship was adapted to something else because the needs called for it. But the Shinado was not a well-designed carrier, partially because she wasn't designed to be a carrier, but also because her design was ultimately rushed. In fact, when she was launched in order to sail, her watertight doors weren't even functioning. The automatic pumps weren't functioning. So if they were hit by anything, there was no way to deal with the damage. They had portable pumps, but the crew wasn't trained to use them very well. Captain Toshio Abe even asked his superiors if they could delay launching the ship to let some of the parts of it get completed. At least make it so that, you know, a hit might be survivable. But High Command said, absolutely not. Sail that thing. Right now. So he did. And it did not go well. I don't think I should launch unless this ship is finished. LAUNCH THIS SHIP! Yeah, but like, the pumps don't work, and there's a bunch of, you know, civilians on board trying to finish construction. LAUNCH THE SHIP! The watertight doors aren't even in place. You, I can't even shut them properly. LAUNCH THE SHIP! One of the reasons Shinano is a bit more obscure is that A, there's only two pictures of her ever taken. B, she only lasted ten days after she was launched. It didn't help that when they were designing all of the Yamato-class ships, there was intense secrecy, which is hilarious to me, because you're designing and building the largest battleships in the world, but you're, you want to be top secret about it? Like, nobody can discuss this massive, giant thing we have in the harbor. Like, you know, people can see that. Apparently, at some parts during the Yamato's construction, they would have, like, drapes over it so no one could see what they were doing. Like, they were really gonna hide the biggest battleship in the world behind a cover, but okay, guys. I think there's a battleship over there. There's no ship here! It's pretty big. No, no ship here! It's like a giant shadow. I see no ship here! Covered it with a drape, but I can still see it. No! No! No, it's 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 there. I, I'm pretty sure that's a boat. It's big, it's a mountain. It's big mountain. It's huge in the middle of the harbor. Just shut up! There's a boat in the harbor. Oh, oh, oh. It displaced so much water that my house is flooded. It caused a tsunami. Oh, I can see it! And when they were building the Shinano, the workmen were actually sworn to secrecy, and speaking about the ship's construction would actually be, be punishable by death. And it must have at least worked somewhat from an intelligence perspective, because America actually didn't know about the Shinano until after the war. The Shinano wound up being sunk by an American submarine, the Archer Fish, which was commanded by Joseph F. Enright. It's probably relevant before we get to the end of the story to say that the uh, Shinano is the largest warship ever sunk by a submarine. So, uh... You can see where this is going. But I think the worst thing about the Shinano in particular is that she probably could have been useful for the Japanese during the war because she was an aircraft carrier. That was more useful than the battleship. Redesigning her as one was a good idea, if only they'd done it properly. But there was so much misdirection and nonsense going on when it came to the engagement between the Shinano and the Archerfish. Theoretically, the Shinado could have outrun the Archer Fish. Submarines were not very fast, and the Shinado did have a higher top speed, except that one of its components overheated, so it couldn't actually reach that top speed. Also, the zigzagging it was doing. That's when ships do kind of the zigzag formation, designed to avoid enemy subs. The zigzagging the Shinado was doing was somehow always causing it to close the gap with the archer fish, not the other way around. To the point that one of the zigzags actually made it completely broadside the submarine, which is the exact positioning a submarine wants to engage you. The archer fish fired six torpedoes and four of them hit, causing way more damage than even Captain Abe realized. And I can't overstate that enough. Literally, he told them to be lax on damage control because he didn't think it was that bad. Sir, we have to start damage control immediately. No, it's fine. You mean it's fine? Don't worry about it. There's four holes in the ship. No, yeah, we'll walk it off. That doesn't even make it in context. It was only after the ship started listing and continued to list that eventually Captain Abe was like, oh, oh, yeah, maybe uh, your ship is in a bad state. Could have been the explosions. That's just my thought. Ultimately, the ship couldn't be saved, and she sunk. And so was the end of the Yamato-class battleships. All three gone. All three... Well, remembered. You gotta give them that. People do like battleships. They're good for PR when it comes to 
navies all over the world. They represent the might and power of a country's naval force. They just look powerful, and they feel powerful. You know, you feel invincible when you're on board a battleship, but ultimately, it's not relevant in the face of aircraft. The scope of war was changing at the time. Back when it was just ships fighting ships, you know, you could get away with having a massive, you know, horrific ship that just blew the crap out of everything before it. But whenever you have a bunch of gnats flying around you, and you just can't hit dropping bombs on your head, what are you going to do about that? You're just a bigger target at that point. The Bismarck learned that before the Yamato class did, and then both the Yamato class battleships were sunk by aircraft. The Shinano was lost to a submarine, but even that was newer technology. So sadly, battleships were rendered obsolete during World War II. There were a few that served a little later in some other wars, but for the most part, you don't see them anymore. And nowadays, navies replace them with, well, aircraft carriers and missile boats are mostly used in the grand scope of things, and then gone are the days of the majestic battleships of old. But people like to think about the Yamato in terms of the pride it represents for the Japanese armed forces back then. And I can't say I blame them. It was a huge ship, it was an impressive achievement from a construction point of view, and ultimately, they were pretty cool boats at the end of the day. So, till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell. Hey guys, I hope you liked the video. Welcome all newcomers and welcome all oldcomers. I'm hoping to make more history videos just like this one for this channel, and I hope you'll stick around to, uh, well, watch them. It's a little silly for me to make them if you don't watch them. I'm just throwing it out there. Anyway, so, so on that note, you should probably hit that subscribe button, and then the bell, and then for the bell, like hit everything, and then you are alerted to all the videos I upload on this channel. And hey, if you're feeling really crazy, follow me on Twitter, or follow me on Facebook over there on Dark the Curse. Oh, in addition, I also have a Patreon, and uh, you can donate a monthly sum to me. Uh, that'll help support videos just like this one. I do this in my spare time, I have a day job, but uh, any little bit will help me. And uh, the more money I have, the more I'm able to uh, buy newer equipment, or spend more time doing stuff like this just for you guys. So with that, until next time, I'll see you all later.